Chapter 4. After dinner, Milo rushed upstairs and picked up Dr. Silverfish's book. He was so excited he was almost afraid to open it. But the doctor seemed to be staring back at him with a look that said, quit staring at me and open the book. So Milo did. Day two. Think of it. You're getting closer all the time. But what are you doing sitting there with a stalk of broccoli around your neck? Why, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Don't even, don't even think about turning the page until you take it off. Well, that's funny since it was Dr. Silverfish that told Milo to do it, isn't it? Milo was surprised at Dr. Silverfish's reaction, but he removed the broccoli gladly. Then he turned the page. Well, that's more like it. Imagine coming to a famous doctor like me with a stalk of broccoli dangling in front of you. All I can say is you must have a lot of courage. In fact, you must be absolutely fearless. It is a well-known fact that there is nothing in the entire world more humiliating than wearing a stalk of broccoli around your neck. So just think, you have nothing more to fear for the rest of your life. Even if you put your pants on backwards or wear two different colored socks, a hat with grapes on it, and a diaper, you will never look as silly as you did a moment ago. Obviously, you will never be embarrassed again. This Dr. Silverfish is pretty funny, isn't he? Congratulations, you have conquered fear, and that's the first step toward being perfect. Hmm. Now for step two. From now until exactly this time tomorrow, don't eat. What do I mean? I mean don't eat or drink except for water. No food or drink, period. No liver, no octopus, no chocolate-covered shrimp. No pistachio ice cream sodas with whipped chili toppings. Not even boring foods like pepperoni and pineapple pizza. Nothing. Cheat on this one and you'll never be perfect. So, until tomorrow, stay hungry. Oh my, what do you think? Do you think he's going to be willing to do that? Milo looked at his watch. It read 6.52. How could he not eat until 6.52 the next day? It was impossible. If only he'd known, he would have stoked up with a extra big with extra big helpings at dinner, but now he couldn't even have his bedtime snack. It hadn't been more than a few minutes since dessert, but Milo already felt hungry and miserable. Here he was, starving, yet if he wanted to become perfect, there was no way he could eat anything, not even broccoli. Still, he was determined not to give up. After tossing the broccoli in the wastebasket, he decided he'd try to take his mind off his stomach. He went downstairs to the living room to watch TV. Hey, where's your broccoli? His sister demanded. Milo thought fast. Oh, I already know all my lines by heart. Yeah? Let's hear. Milo improvised. I am a broccoli, big and green. That's plenty, Alyssa interrupted and turned back to her program. Milo tried to watch it too, but the ads for hamburgers and fish sandwiches and soft drinks and candies only made him hungrier. He went to his room and turned on the radio, but that was no better. He tried reading a book, but it began with a family at the dinner table, and he just couldn't stomach it. Finally, he lay down and went to sleep. All night long, he dreamed of pies and cakes and pork chops that looked absolutely perfect, but he couldn't eat them even in his dream. It was very frustrating. At least he didn't dream about broccoli. He'd had quite enough of broccoli for a while. In the morning, he awoke with the biggest appetite of his life. He didn't fight with his sister over who'd use the bathroom first, since he didn't think perfect people did things like that, and he was too weak to argue anyhow. It seemed to take him forever to get dressed. Milo, his father shouted, come downstairs to breakfast. I'm not going to eat breakfast today, Milo yelled back feebly. What's wrong? Are you sick? No, I just don't want anything to eat. You come downstairs and we'll discuss it. Milo didn't even want to look at food because he was so hungry he might break down and eat something and miss out on becoming perfect. But he went downstairs anyhow. His mother was spreading a big spoonful of strawberry jam on a piece of raisin toast. 
What's this about your not wanting breakfast? She asked. I'm not going to eat anything this morning, Milo said reluctantly. Milo had too much broccoli yesterday, laughed Alyssa, shoving half an instant waffle into her mouth. Milo, something doesn't seem quite right with you, said his father between gulps of tomato juice. First the broccoli and now this. Do you feel all right? Milo nodded weakly. Are you sure, asked his father. Milo tried to act peppier. I'm fine, he said. Won't you at least have some juice? No, I'm just not hungry. Suit yourself, said his father. Missing one meal never hurt anybody. Milo looked longingly at the cereal, the milk, the juice, the toast, the jelly, the butter, and the instant waffles. He tried not to inhale too deeply. What does inhale mean? Listen to the clues that come after. But aromas kept reaching out and tickling his nose. Hmm, aromas means smells. If they're tickling his nose, what does that mean that he's trying not to inhale too deeply? So he felt very proud that he was able to resist temptation and make it to school without having anything but three large glasses of water. His classmates kept asking him where his broccoli was today, but Milo told them his illness was cured. The kids called him things like broccoli head and the human vegetable, but now that he knew he was fearless, those names didn't bother him. Besides, he felt sort of like a human vegetable. Do you think if, if he doesn't let it bother him that maybe they'll get tired of, of teasing him with it? I think so. By the, time, by the time lunch hour rolled around, Milo was positively starving, but he was more determined than ever not to eat. He offered his peanut butter and alfalfa sprout sandwich to anybody who wanted it, but he had to feed it to the pigeons. Nobody else was willing to risk catching Milo's strange disease. At the water fountain, Milo held up the line until everybody yelled, Save some for the fishes! in chorus for the fifth time. Milo had a lot of trouble getting through the afternoon. His stomach started to complain, and it simply refused to shut up. In the middle of Miss Lexter's English class, it made embarrassing gurgles. During music class, it kept singing off-key. The teachers were kind enough to ignore it, but the kids never stopped giggling. All Milo could do was give them a look as if to say, I told you I was sick and send silent messages to his stomach to quiet down. After school, Milo trudged home. His sister was having an afternoon snack of carrot cake and milk. Just looking at the food made Milo feel weak. He went straight upstairs to lie down. Next thing he knew, his sister was yelling at him to come down to dinner. Still half asleep, he groggily told her he'd be right there. Then he remembered he couldn't eat anything for another hour or so. Suddenly, the smell of his favorite food sweet and sour wonton from Bo Woe's to go restaurant in the shopping center wafted up to him from the dining room. Dinner time, Milo, yelled his father. Your food's getting cold. The wonton smelled wonderful. Milo had to make a superhuman effort to resist. I'm not hungry, he said weakly. A minute later, Mr. Crinkly came upstairs and stormed into Milo's room. What's all this foolishness, he demanded. Are you feeling sick? Yes, said Milo, and it wasn't a lie. Because after not eating for so long, he doesn't feel well, does he? How? My stomach has kind of an empty filling. Why don't you come downstairs and fill it up? I don't feel like it, Milo said. Maybe I have the flu. Maybe I'll be able to eat something later. Just then, a book on Milo's desk caught Mr. Crinkly's eye. It was a thin volume, and it had a picture of a peculiar-looking man on the back. Milo hoped his dad wouldn't start flipping through it, but that's exactly what he did. Be a perfect person in just three days, his father said. Have you been reading this? Milo didn't know what to say. Even though he was fearless, he felt slightly embarrassed. Well, sort of. Mr. Crinkly looked at the book to looked at the book some more. It says here you're not supposed to eat anything on day two. Is that what you're up to? Milo nodded weakly. So that explains it, his father laughed. Why didn't you tell us? I thought everybody would laugh at me and that's just what you're doing, Milo moaned. Besides, I wanted to be perfect and surprise you. 
I'm not laughing at you, said Mr. Crinkley and buried his nose in the book again. He was a very fast reader. Milo watched him raise his eyebrows and wrinkle his nose and scratch his ear as he scanned the pages. Then Mr. Crinkley shut the book and laid it back on the desk. You know, Milo, it might be nice to have one perfect person in the family. Please don't tell Mom about it, or especially Alyssa. It's hard enough already without her making funny remarks. My lips are sealed, said Mr. Crinkley. How much longer till you're perfect? Tomorrow night, I hope. Well, good luck. I'm going down to dinner. And Milo's father went out the door. Milo lay on his bed and listened to his stomach growl until about 6.30. He had read Dr. Silverfish's last comments at exactly 6.52 last night, so he had to wait until 6.53 tonight, since his watch always ran a little fast, to see what Dr. Silverfish wanted him to do next. Milo never knew time could creep by so slowly. A minute seemed like an hour. Five minutes might as well have been a year. Maybe when you were almost perfect, time went slower. The hands of his watch crept forward. 650, 651, 652, 652 and a half, 652 and three quarters, 653. Milo grabbed the book and pawed it open. End of day two. I bet you could eat a horse. Hungry? Naturally. Please don't eat a horse. Anything else is okay. When you're finished eating, turn the page. Milo stuck a baseball card in the book to mark his place and went downstairs. The rest of the family was, was watching TV. I think I could eat something now, Milo said. Too late, Alyssa sneered. We finished every last wonton. Feeling better, his mother asked. Yes, said Milo, hungry even. I can wrestle something up for you if you can wait till this program's over, said his father. Milo couldn't wait. Don't bother, he said. He went into the kitchen and fixed himself an excellent supper. He had a sardine sandwich, a peanut butter sandwich, and a bologna sandwich, an apple, an orange, a pear, and a banana. Four pieces of butter crumb cake, three oatmeal raisin cookies, and two huge helpings of cherry vanilla ice cream with chocolate fudge sauce, plus a piece of strawberry rhubarb pie for dessert. It wasn't sweet and sour wonton, but it all tasted terrific. Afterwards, Milo felt a lot better, even though his stomach sent up a few strange flavored burps of protest. My goodness, I don't think he would feel better at all after eating all that food at once. That's the end of the chapter.